the first thing I want you to notice here is that we see many examples of that word, that time, that phrase, or those two little words, but God. In Genesis chapter 20 and verse number 3 through 4, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Yeah, that would scare you a little bit, wouldn't it? You're sleeping away, and all of a sudden, God comes to you and says, Thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? See, Abraham was about ready to lose his wife to Abimelech because of his deceitfulness, because of his lies. In order that he wanted to protect his wife, look what happened. The opposite happened. He didn't protect her. He didn't guard her. He lied. He, dece he was deceitful. He didn't trust God. And what happened? He almost lost her. So what did God do? God interceded for him. But God, if it wasn't for God, that's the same thing that can be said about my life and your life tonight. If you've been saved by grace, but God, who is rich in mercy with his great love wherewith he loved us. Joseph is another example. Turn to Genesis chapter 45 and verse number 8 and 9. Joseph is explaining some things to his brother, his brethren. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. He hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son, Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. He said, in verse Genesis, or in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says this, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph was able to say, he's able to look at his brethren, and he's able to see things heavenly. This is the mind of Christ. That's what this is. When you see your circumstances, if you see yourself a victim, you're going to be a loser all your life. I want to say that to you again, to make sure you're listening and pay attention well. If you ever see yourself as a victim, you're going to be a loser your whole life. You're going to walk around and make excuses for your sin, make excuses for your ill behavior, blame everybody for everything that goes on in your life, and not take personal responsibility. Amen. And sit around and whine and cry and lick your wounds. That's what people do that are victims. Joseph was in a worse situation than you and I will ever be in in our lives. He wasn't a victim. What did he say? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. There are things, friend, that happen in your life, and they will happen in your life, that will not be pleasant things. They will not be sweet things. People will do you evil, and they will do you wrong. But I'm telling you, even what they do to you will be just like what happened to Joseph. And you can say the same thing. I can say this years later after going through hard trials and, and having people reject and, 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 and uh, people hate me and everything else and lie and do all these things and things that happen to my mind and heart and, and depressions and anxieties and everything else. But what they meant for evil, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. And it has gone to the glory of God. And I am still here by God's grace doing what God has called me to do. And seeing people saved just like God has called us to preach the gospel to see people saved. And still seeing people nurtured and growing in their faith. Seeing families live for God and serve God and be faithful to God. And all I can say to you is it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with but God. But God meant it unto good. That's why. Because God meant it unto good. No matter what evil man may do to you, no matter what evil man may think to perform against you and to put against you, it doesn't matter. It won't change what God is going to do. God will use it to his glory. If you are a child of God, he will use it to his glory. He will use it for his honor and glory. If you will trust him and you will see the bigger picture and you will see that God is above all, you will think with the mind of Christ and not, not in your own silly circumstances. 
and you look around at your circumstances and you become a victim of circumstances. It's a very unhealthy thing to do. And by the way, let me say this. You are never going to mature as a Christian thinking like that either. In order to mature as a Christian, you have to practice right things. You have to have the mind of Christ, and you have to practice right things. You have to have your, your mind renewed daily in the Word of God. So you have to think like Christ. You can't think like a victim. Joseph never thought like a victim. He's sitting in prison. He's lied about over and over again. He's lied about. He's taken advantage of. He's used as a slave. He's forgotten by man, but not by God. Because God was with him all the way. And you, you, you talk about the three Hebrew children, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then Daniel, and where are they at? They're in, the, they're, they're in a wicked and They're in Babylon. They are straight up in Babylon. No picture of Babylon. They are in Babylon, okay? That is Babylon. That's where they're at. They are right in the heart and center of witchcraft central right there. And what are they doing? Preaching and living for God. Same thing you and I have to do in a What are we going to do? This world's getting worse. You're going to do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. You're going to do what Daniel did. You're going to preach the word of God. And you're going to be lights in a dark world. That's what you're going to do. Amen. Amen. That's what we do. Our circumstances don't change truth. It never changes the truth. Circumstances don't change the truth. They prove it. They prove it. God, by the way, if you're God's child, he will prove to you that he will be with you through all things. He will prove it to you. He will prove it to you. Amen. He surely will. Our text verse is the exact same thing as those two situations. We see the terrible things of the last three verses, then we see but God. It is the great transition in this passage. We were dead in sin, slaves of the devil, children of wrath, on our way to eternal damnation. But God, God only, God made the difference and brought salvation. The sinners of verse 1 through 3 were not seeking God, but God sought them by the preaching of the gospel and the ministration of the Holy Spirit. The sinners of verse 1 through 3 could not save themselves by any means whatsoever, but God saved them. Salvation is 100% of the Lord. It is God's plan, God's mercy, God's love, God's grace, God's kindness, God's workmanship. And you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Look at the first three verses. Things are not going well. We who are sinners by nature and children of wrath. Things look pretty bad, don't they, there? Children of disobedience, children of wrath, dead in trespasses and sins. But God, God is the author of salvation. You're, listen to me. Your strength and assurance of salvation needs to be biblical assurance, lest it be a false hope that God would reveal to you. Meaning that it is the word of God and the Holy Ghost that shows us that we do not bring ourselves to this place of repentance and faith, but it is God that does that work. Amen. You, didn't, you don't will yourself saved. It isn't a work of man, it's the work of God. That's what it is. It is God, and that's, by the way, don't you understand that's the strength of assurance as well? When you understand that, that, yep. well, I, di I didn't, he didn't do this to me. <laughs> I, I couldn't do this to me. Couldn't change me. Wanted to change me at times, and at times I didn't want to change me. <laughs> I wanted to be the old rotten self I was, right? But it's God that has to change you. You, you can't do it yourself. There, you, you don't have any power to do it. If you, you keep trying to change you, you boy, you're going to be a wreck. It's God that does that work. And we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's what you have to understand. You have to give glory to God. When you're seeking out assurance and you're struggling with things in your life, and if you're ever struggling with assurance, the one thing you need not do is focus too much on yourself. It won't do you any good. The more you focus on yourself when trying to be assured of your salvation, the worse it's going to get. Because you're starting at the wrong point. Amen. 
You listening to me? You're starting at the wrong place. You're trying to seek assurance in yourself. You're trying to seek assurance by what you did. But I did this or I did that. No, 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 no. The salvation doesn't start with I. It starts with him. It doesn't start with I. It starts with him. It's him. It's not you. It's not me. I didn't do it. Was it me? I couldn't do it. it. Couldn't change me. I couldn't make me new. I couldn't do any of those things. Salvation is of the Lord. It's God that brings. You have to understand. It's not in your power to do it. It's God's power that changed you. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to explain here. He's trying to tell Christians. You get that, right? You you, you get that, right? Like he's. You do know this is an epistle to the Ephesians, right? You know who the Ephesians are, right? It's a church at Ephesus, right? It was the, the Ephesian Christians there. They were saved people. Remember? He just, no, no, he's, tell, he's telling the lost so they could be saved. Well, praise the Lord, they could be saved. Amen. And they, they read that, and, and that'll show them the difference between lost and saved. But that's not who he's addressing this to. He's addressing this to save people. He's telling you how to gain assurance of your salvation. He's telling you of the blessings that you have in the Lord. And he's saying, don't you forget, and you have he quickened. Amen. Who are dead in trespasses and sins. Right. Where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That was you. And then he goes on and he explains how bad you and I were all the way through. <laughs> this is who we are. This is who we were. Then he says in verse 4, but God. He reminds you again, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins. You, you get that? Well, what did you do? You were just dead. You're the old nasty wretch he came to save. That's what you are. That's what I am. You don't like that? Why not? I do. I love it. Why do I love it? Because I know he did it. That's why. I know how nasty and wicked I am. That's why. And I know it took him to breathe life into me, that it wasn't of myself. Like, I couldn't do this. Couldn't, I couldn't fake it till I made it. I tried that. It didn't work very well. I made a miserable mess of that. The most dangerous time of my life, I can look back and say the most dangerous time of my life, on the tipping point of destroying my life, was right before I got saved. Oh, man. Woo, it was close, man. I'm going to tell you what. I was, I was teetered on the edge of destruction, man. Absolute destruction. Made a mess of things. Was making a mess of things. But God. That's all I can say to you is but God. Because it is God that is the author of salvation. Your strength and assurance of salvation needs to be biblical assurance, lest it be the false hope. Natural man has no interest in and of himself in the gospel. He has no interest in being born again. He doesn't. He has an interest in sinning. Would you agree with that? I, I, I can agree with that. I, I can agree with that wholeheartedly, that the only thing I had an interest in when I was a lost man was sinning. I didn't have any interest in holiness at all. I mean, I wanted to go to heaven. I just didn't want to be holy. I wanted to go to heaven. I just didn't want God to be there. Right? I mean, I just, everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there. Right? If you don't like him being holy here, you ain't going to like him there. Well, you know what would be hell for you? If you were a lost person and you went into heaven. That would be hell for you. Why would it? Because everything around you would be holy and you'd be filthy. You'd hate heaven. Get this. If you hate this Christian life now, you ain't going to like heaven either. I'm going to say that to you again. If you hate this Christian life now, you won't like heaven either. Right. You, can't, you won't. It'd be hell for you to go to heaven. That'd be terrible. You wouldn't like anything there. You'd want sin and wickedness and, and, and perversion and, and, and everything else. You'd want everything wicked in this world, and heaven don't have any of that. You'd burn up as soon as you got there. You wouldn't make it anyway. As soon as you walked in there filthy, you'd be gone. You wouldn't even make it there. None of us would in our flesh. No flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. 
You see, natural man, his interest is in sin. He's very good at sinning. Very good. Like, makes a career out of it. Right, Jacob? Makes it. In our flesh, I mean, especially as lost people, when we were lost and dead in sins, it says dead in sins for a reason. Right? It don't say sleeping in sins. It don't say you're a little drowsy in sin. It says you are dead in sin. Nasty. Defiled. Dead in sins. So then God uses the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He uses the gospel, the Bible, to prick our hearts and to bring us to repentance and faith. Salvation is of the Lord. You should, and, should, and Christ should always be credited. You need not to fear the amount of repentance and faith that you have and try to ponder some perfection of your faith. No, perfection is the Lord's work and not yours. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God that works in you. It isn't. It isn't you. I, I never want you to hear a gospel that exalts man. I do not preach a gospel that exalts man. I, I have never, to my knowledge, since I've been saved, preached a gospel that exalts man. I would not do that. We preach a gospel that exalts Christ. That's what the gospel is. There's nothing good in us. There, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. There's everything good in God. And he is the source of all goodness. Never, never listen to a man that preaches a gospel that exalts man. Never listen to that. It's, it's wicked. It's, it's a wicked, vile thing to exalt man, to lift up man, or to think that there's some good in man. There is no good in man. There's good in God, and the only good that's in us, when Barnabas was a good man, it was, why was Barnabas a good man? Is that a contradiction? No. The Bible explains why he was a good man. Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. Why was he a good man? Because he was full of the Holy Ghost. That's why. But when God speaks, there is none good, no, not one. He's talking about the fallen nature of man. He's talking about lost man in his flesh. There is no good in him. Amen. I mean, that doesn't mean that you don't do kind things or anything like that, but it's always tainted by our selfishness. It's God that makes the works good. Do you know good works are, are, are filthy rags before you're saved, and after they're saved, after you're saved, they're not. Why? Because they're sanctified by Christ, and he's what makes them good. Christ is what makes your works good after you're saved. You get that, don't you? You understand that, that that's Christ that does? I'm giving you some good theology lessons here for you to understand and take home with you. You know, practical things that you'll, you'll take home with you every day, and you, you'll remember, and you'll be able to apply to your lives and remember that it's the good works that we do after we're saved are because Christ made them good. Just like when he, when he touched the bitter waters and he made them sweet, that's what God does with our lives. Once you get the Holy Ghost, things start looking up, brother. Amen. They start looking up, don't they? Amen. They sure do. That's God's promise. God is the author and the finisher, which means the perfecter as well. That's what that word means, finisher and perfecter. Nothing wrong with that word to explain it. But he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the perfecter of it. He will mature it and bring it to where it needs to be because he is the author of it.